This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, we're on to the next committee, Remuneration Committee. Importance. Executive directors should not be responsible for determining their own remuneration. So who's going to decide the executive director's remuneration? Who's going to decide the executive director's remuneration? The remuneration committee. The remuneration decisions can be seen to be taken by those who will not benefit. No director should be involved in determining their own remuneration. It used to be the case before 1992, before Cadbury, before this Cadbury report and corporate governance, directors used to decide their own remuneration. Shareholders never had a, a look in, shareholders still don't. But now we've got this concept of an independent subcommittee of the non-executive directors, one of whose tasks is to determine the remuneration of the executive board. We had an expression in the UK about directors who would take excessive or substantial huge salaries uh, and we used to call them fat cats and they would they would rise to the top of the company and then when they got to the top of the company they were then able to lick the cream of the profits off the company and they became big fat cats. But fat cats should no longer exist. They people at the top do get paid that question question one in your revision kit a man's being paid a salary of five hundred and sixteen thousand pounds five hundred and sixteen thousand that's just about ten thousand a week as near as makes no difference that's two thousand a day could you spend two thousand a day I, admittedly it's before tax but don't forget he's also got his bonus and his employee share scheme and his and his uh, benefits in kind could you spend two thousand a day I mean how many pairs of shoes do you really want at that price if you want quality you have to pay for it and if you don't pay for it if you pay peanuts what do you get if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. And we don't want monkeys running the company because the role of the executive board is to drive up the value of the company, to improve total shareholder return. And the people best qualified are the people who are likely able to command the best salaries. Remuneration decisions then can be seen to be taken by those who will not benefit. It didn't used to be the case when I was at your level, but it is now. And there is need for a formal, transparent procedure for developing policy and for individual packages. The role, therefore, of the committee is that they will determine appropriate packages for the executive directors. A different one for each. Different performance measures for each. There's no point in, in remunerating the human resource director on the basis of sales achieved or efficiencies in production or marketing efficient effectiveness there's no point in remunerating the marketing manager on the basis of the um, human resource staff turnover rate so we need different measures for different directors what sort of efficiency measure would you use for the chief financial officer the number of creative accounting steps that they've managed to get away with without the auditor finding them well, how do you measure the performance measure of a chief financial officer? Well, I suppose... I suppose you could actually use the external auditors as being a, a benchmark. The number of occasions the external auditor has discovered errors in the CFO's accounting preparations, maybe. I suppose you could use that as some sort of measure. But the role, the committee determines appropriate packages for each of the executive directors individually. And the composition of those packages, the composition of the packages, uh, yeah, I think we can cover that on the next page. Composition of the packages will vary from one director to another. But basically you're looking at basic salary, 
plus performance related pay, plus bonuses therefore, possibly the performance related pay, plus benefits in kind, uh, and a combination of pension entitlements, share options, employee share schemes, uh, all of these combined will then become the package available and, and um, awarded to the executive directors. In listed entities, the committee will typically comprise NEDs and accountabilities that they will report to the main board. But they also will report, the report of the remuneration committee, is that they will be accountable to the shareholders and they will have within the financial statements a report of the remuneration committee. And what are the three things that the remuneration committee do? They will decide upon a package, a salary package, in order that they should be able to and and no, not total shareholders return. Attract, yeah, attract, attract, retain and motivate. Yeah, attract, retain and motivate. Uh, so greater benefits in kind, or they may consider, I'm sorry, they may consider greater benefits in kind to compensate for lower basics. If you pay somebody a basic, low, regular salary that they don't have to work for, as in no matter how much work they do, they still get the same, that's okay. So long as the amount of work or the quality and effectiveness of their work is then compensated by giving them greater benefits in kind. So you would measure the benefits in kind against the amount of work that they've done and the achievements that they have achieved. So it may be that greater benefits in kind are paid to compensate for basic salaries. Offering non-cash motivation for some or all of the company's employees and non-cash motivators could include things like crash facilities, cars, additional holiday time, accommodation costs, travel costs, disruption costs, relocation costs. Clothing allowances, book allowances. I was speaking to a friend of mine from Scotland just two days ago and he was telling me that his daughter has started work in a, a company. She's just qualified from university and she's an actuary. Uh, she's training to be an actuary. She's just got a mathematics degree. Uh, and she's allowed £2,000 a year to buy appropriate textbooks. Well, that's part of the salary package, isn't it? Because otherwise she'd have to pay for it herself. So what's a crash? It's for children, no? It's for children, yes. Yeah. Some mothers to raise new mothers to bring their babies into work so that mothers can get back to work earlier than may otherwise have been the case and, and they'll put their baby down in a room and, and go and do some work and somebody will look after the baby and clean it and wash it and and maybe bottle feed it uh, or at least the baby's there in order that the mother can come back and feed it so that's what a creche is, it's a place for keeping babies like a refrigerator is a place for keeping milk cold isn't it? That's very nice. see? that's very nice nice to have nice to have, yeah, nice to have possibly won't work in your firm it could potentially work in yours. You have enough <coughs> female employees of appropriate childbearing age that you may have enough young mothers who want to come back to work and, and who can't yet because they're still looking after babe at home. I don't know whether you do or not. I can't remember how many you've got. Availability of entity resource the company may consider, the remuneration committee may consider the availability of entity resource. We may not have much cash. We, may, we might not be a cash-rich company. Um, but instead of paying cash, we could maybe give shares as an incentive. And you will remember from your PT's, P2 studies that these shares that we give as an, as an incentive will represent an expense in the income statement, even though it's actually not cost us anything to give a promise of issuing shares, it's nevertheless an expense and needs to be recognised as such. 
but it still doesn't hurt our cash resource. An encouragement of long-term loyalty by offering share purchase schemes, and again this needs to be recognised as an expense. If you will stay with the company for three years, then at the end of three years you then have the opportunity to take up some shares at an advantageous price. So that will encourage loyalty. There's nothing worse so far as companies, well, I suppose there are things worse, uh, so far as companies are concerned, than having a fast turnover of staff because all the time you're having to retrain and retrain and retrain again and people are just moving through and by the time you've got them trained uh, then they want to leave and so you have to start all over again. So far as audit firms are concerned that's not a bad thing. That a continuous flow of employment and employees is not a bad thing for an audit firm. Page 46, the Remuneration Committee Responsibilities. <clears throat> Determine and review the framework, the policy and the specific terms for remuneration. The terms and conditions of employment of the chair and of the executive directors. Remember the chair is not necessarily sitting on the remuneration committee. The remuneration committee is primarily comprised of NEDs. And not necessarily does the chair of the company also sit on that committee. So they are the ones who are responsible. This committee is responsible for determining the remuneration and the conditions of employment of the execs and of the chair. They will recommend and monitor the level and structure of the remuneration of senior management. So not the executive board but the departmental heads. A set detailed remuneration for all executives and the chair, including their pension rights and compensation payments. Was there a high profile chief executive who's just lost his job at the end of, well, in three days' time or four days' time, the end of October? It's a high profile chief executive of a British company who's just about to lose his job. A man called Tony. If I tell you his family name, you will immediately recognise it. Haywood. Tony Haywood, about to be removed from his position as chief executive of a, a major British company that digs oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico and creates 50,000 barrels of oil leakage every 10 seconds in the Gulf of Mexico and destroys the shrimp and oyster fishing of the people of Louisiana. Are we not getting any nearer to saying BP? The BP chief executive is going to lose his job on the 30th, I think it's the 31st October, unless he's already left. I think he loses it, his job on, on, actually, coincidentally, on John's birthday. Hmm. which is also the, the day when people dress up as witches and it's a frightening sight to see John dressed up as a witch. Where are we now? I think you'd better eliminate that last five minutes. Uh, ensure that executive directors and senior management are fairly rewarded for their individual contributions but don't treat them as a group. The executive and the senior management need individually to be assessed in order to determine their levels of fair remuneration. Demonstrate to the shareholders that the remuneration of execs and senior management is set by individuals with no direct interest. Agree compensations for loss of office. I can't remember what Tony Hayward is getting. I have a feeling it's a year's salary. <clears throat> I do know he's no longer employed by them. I do know the, uh, the man who is in charge of the local offices of um, Carlsberg and he was made redundant locally where I'm living. He was made redundant and was paid a year's salary by way of compensation. So he's then looking around but whilst he was looking around he was talking to one of the head guys of Carlsberg in Denmark and they said, oh we'll find you a job. So he got a year's compensation for loss of office and two months later he walked back into the better job than he was doing in Denmark. 
and then I heard from him about five weeks ago he's lost that job as well so now he's got another year's worth of compensation from Carlsberg in respect of the second time he's been made redundant within a period of six months it's not so bad is it he's got no expenses other than his former wife uh, and child he's got no expenses other than that um, and two years worth of salary in order to give him time to find something suitable as a replacement nice work if you can get it uh, have we done that? agree compensation and ensure that provision for disclosure of remuneration including pensions as set out in the combined code is followed here's another subcommittee the nominations committee what do you think the nominations committee does? They nominate, yeah, they find people who they feel are suitable to be nominated as potential directors. Yeah, the nominations committee is that they will find, identify, they will headhunt, basically. They're a group of headhunters. And they will, the importance is that they need to be seen to be unbiased and impartial. They need to be objective in order to ensure appointments are made in line with prior grade specifications. So there's no point in identifying somebody who doesn't actually fit the position that we want to be filled. Square pegs and round holes, we need somebody that's ideal for that position. The role is to identify appropriate people to be invited. Determines appropriate packages for the executive directors and for the composition of those packages. <clears throat> the committee determines appropriate packages for the executive directors and the composition of those packages I'm not sure I like that I think that's just cut and paste the remuneration committee I don't like that that's not what their role is they're not there to determine appropriate packages for executive directors they're there to determine appropriate packages for prospective I'm going to change the note. Prospective executive directors and the composition of those packages. <clears throat> composition, executive directors and NEDs, but NEDs should be the majority. Why have we got executives in there? Executives? Because they are involved. In because what? <laughs> Because they are involved in, in, in... Yeah, because these are the people that are going to have to work closely with any executive directors and senior management who are appointed. And there's no point in, in the nominations committee nominating someone who clearly will be like pouring water into acid and, and there's a, a tremendous adverse chemical reaction. So we'll, we'll need to have somebody on the nominations committee need to have some people on the nominations committee uh, with whom this nominated person is likely to have to work with or with whom this nominated person is likely to have to work so that we don't have adverse reactions and we don't have a, a bad chemical reaction when this person does come in and join the company so we do need the executive directors the day-to-day -day workers because these are the people who are going to have day-to-day -day contact but it's the NEDs who should be in the majority Accountability will make recommendations to the main board but the final decisions should be made by the main board as a whole. So we'll make our recommendations to the executive board but it's the board including the NEDs who should make the final decision. Overall responsibilities are to review regularly structure, size and composition of the board make recommendations to the board for new nominees full consideration to succession planning what's succession planning? that's what you and you have been involved with that's what you too have been involved with succession planning yes. I don't want to know I don't it, it, 
It's again, again. But the company will do uh, when the directors will leave. Yeah, when the when the older ones are going, then we need some new ones in their place, ready to just assume the reins of control. I had a client who um, had. 75% of the shares and his wife had 25% of the shares of the company um, and he got a tremendous pension already paid but he wanted to keep working and he was 85 years old he was 85 and he came into work every day driving his Rolls Royce into work and about three weeks before a particular event he decided that he would give 25% of his 75 to his eldest daughter and another 25 to his youngest daughter, the younger and older two daughters. So we've now got four shareholders of 25% each. Only the younger daughter had expressed any interest at all in, in the company. It was only the younger daughter who was at all interested in the business. And three weeks after he'd done this transfer, he died. Boom, just dropped dead. And his wife, with her 25, inherited his 25 as well, because that would pass to the surviving spouse. The older daughter wasn't interested, so 75% shareholders said, let's sell the company. And the one who wanted to take on the company and run it as her own, she was outvoted, 75-25. Where was the succession planning there? I recommended that he should pass his shares to his younger daughter because she was interested in carrying on the company. No, no, he said, my wife and older daughter will also want to continue the company. But they didn't. So the company was sold and the poor old younger daughter got very little. Succession planning, we need to plan for succession. Just apply it to this company that I am working for here. What succession planning is there here? What succession planning is there for this company? Because the man's getting older. Day by day is getting older, as we all are, but he's getting there faster. So what's the succession planning? Again? Well, you don't know actually what he is doing. He's, um, he's planning all sorts of succession contingencies. and uh, His succession planning is is in place. He's planning successors to take over the business. But we'll not go any deeper into that because it's confidential. Regularly evaluate the balance of skills, knowledge and experience of the board. Prepare a description of the roles and capabilities required. If you don't prepare a description of the roles and capabilities required, you finish up employing someone who doesn't fit the bill, somebody who's not what you wanted. Unless you've got the specific details of what it is you're looking for, then how do you know where to find it? Unless you, unless you know... If I were to say, go out and, and you've never seen a bus, if I were to say, go out and find a bus, where would you know where to start looking? You couldn't. So, detailed description is needed of the role and capabilities required. Identify and nominate for approval candidates to fill the vacancies as they arise and recommend to the board concerning existing directors standing for reappointment. <clears throat> the reappointment of directors is a touchy area. How does this nomination and succession committee recommend to the board that you should not stand for re-election? Oh, we think you've done enough now, you've, your time has gone, you're past your best, you're on the way downhill. We don't need you, we've got somebody else to come along, so don't stand for re-election. That must be a dreadful moment for the nominations committee to have to face. Am I being naive? Maybe I should recommend. Do you want to think about retiring? I think, I think retirement will be a good thing for you. Can I suggest that you do? That means we don't have to suggest that we remove you. It must be an awful thing for the succession committee to have to put up with, or for the individual directors to have to put up with. What about non-execs? How long should they serve? 
There is a recommendation within the Cadbury Code, within the, within the Combined Code, there's a recommendation that a non-exec, once they're appointed, they should not seek re-election on more than two occasions. So they're appointed for three years, they seek re-election, they get appointed for three years, they seek re-election, get appointed for three years, after they've been re-elected twice, so they're elected and then re-elected twice, at the end of that nine-year period they should say, no more, I'm no longer independent. I'm too close to the company, I'm too locked in, I know too much about the company, I'm no longer objective, I'm no longer independent. And so they should not seek re-election after two occasions, that is nine years. It's the same as the auditors, isn't it? It's the same as the auditors. Move them on, get rid. Okay, I'm on to page 48. The Risk Committee or Risk Management Committee. You notice all these committees, I've subdivided the notes into importance, role, composition and accountability. They've all had the same four headings. The board is responsible for risk identification and risk management, both of which involve the establishment of a sound system of internal control. The four ways of, of managing risk, four identified ways in which risk can be managed, is known as the TARA model. Who's TARA? TARA is another of our mnemonics, T-A-R-A, -A, the TARA method of managing risks. T is transfer. A, accept. R, reduce. A, avoid. Now I said Tara because Tara is a sort of generic expression, the Tara model, but I suppose over here you could actually call it the Arta. on the basis that that's a female name here, isn't it? Arta, the Arta model of risk management. Transfer, accept, reduce, avoid the Tara model. We'll come on to that in much greater depth tomorrow. But Tara is also a girl's name in the UK. And we've already had one girl's name today, haven't we? Who do we have? Clarissa. You might want to call her Larissa. Larissa C.W. So go on, give me Clarissa, just for old time's sake. Give me Cla yeah. <laughs> yeah, Give me Clarissa. Create. Create an atmosphere, an environment of discipline and control. L. Lend um, an uh, not air, just lend an air, uh, lend an air of credibility, lend an air of credibility to the financial statements. Uh, a. Assist the CFO by providing a forum. Well done. R. Review the financial statements to see if there's any better way of presenting the information. I. It can only be one of two things. Independence. It's independence. They bring independent judgment to their work. S. Strengthen the role of the internal. internal. S. Strengthen the role of the external auditor. A. Assist in dispute resolution between between executive directors and the external auditors. And who did she marry? She married a whistleblower. Yep. What's Tara? Transfer. 
transfer. Accept. I accept. Reduce and avoid. Transfer, accept, reduce and avoid. Well done. Risk Management Committee. The board is responsible for risk identification and risk management, both of which involve the establishment of this sound system of internal control. The importance of the committee is that it gives an objective view on the entity's risk profile. It's uh, stand back and look. Stand back and assess what risks is the company exposed to. You can't see risks yourselves if you're heavily involved. You only have to stand on the roadside here and watch the quality of driving. The drivers just do not seem to, to think ahead. But you can, if you stand and watch them, you can see that as this car is coming along Zinavu and this one's going down Squalus, that unless one of them slows down, we're going to be in, in, in a collision situation. You can see it, but obviously they can't. They're both of them aggressive drivers. And so that's why you get accidents and they are plenty. So standing back, an objective view, you're not involved, you're independent and the risk management committee being able to stand back is able to see the bigger picture whereas people who are involved may not be able to see that big picture. The role is that they assess internal controls and the strengths of internal controls and therefore also try to identify the weaknesses of internal controls. They perform risk assessments of the entity's key operations and often oversee the implementation and effective operation of the risk strategy, the policies and the procedures for managing. Composition, both execs and NEDs, but NEDs should be in the majority. The execs are there because the execs know daily what, what the daily situation is. The NEDs are involved and therefore may better able to see and accept the perceptions of the non-execs but the non-execs have got this ability to to stand back and, and they've got the advantage of objectivity so ideally we'd have a combination of both execs and nets. Accountability recommendation to the full board of internal control and risk strategy or to the audit committee but then in turn they will report to the full board. Main responsibilities and duties advise the board on the risk management issues, strategy, policy, emphasize and demonstrate the benefits of a risk-based approach to internal controls. Internal auditors think that's the only way. I imagine, and I don't know and I'm dependent upon those of you who work for big four firms, I imagine that a risk-based audit is probably quite a key element of your own audit procedures. Can you, can you tell me I'm right? Is it risk-based or are we traditional systems-based, see that the system is laid down, is working, and then stand back and see whether or not the system is appropriate? Or do you do balance sheet audits and just audit the figures on the balance sheet and, and never mind the income statement, because that doesn't matter? Or do you identify, is what you do in your daily big four auditing life is what you do more a question of trying to identify the risks that your clients may be exposed to and then audit and make sure that they have not suffered from those risks. What do you do? Uh, Andres, can you tell me what do you do? Come on Andres, wake up. Ilza, what do you do? You do essentially risk-based, yeah, okay. I would imagine you do, I would imagine that, that this would, the methodology adopted by big four audit firms is moving more and more towards risk-based auditing. Such appropriate internal control policies regularly assure that the system is functioning properly as laid down. Review the effectiveness of internal controls. Relevant disclosure about internal controls in the financial statements. And review the system of 
internal controls, paying particular attention to the environment, risk assessment, information systems, control procedures, and the monitoring of these. And here we are in another typical, topical, fashionable topic. The corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. Are we going to have a corporate social responsibility committee? Why not? Yeah, why not? Why not? To show that we are, if we establish a corporate social responsibility committee, we're showing the outside world that our corporation is socially responsible. Entities increasingly accepting they have social and environmental responsibilities. Are you? Are you green? Are you, do you consciously in your daily life do you take steps to minimize your footprint? You do? Sort garbage. Are you, are you with your garbage? <laughs> we sort garbage. You sort garbage into glass and plastic and, and recyclable and, and paper. Do you print on both sides of paper or do you only print one side? You try not to print at all, yeah. And you've got, on, certainly on yours, you've got a little message at the bottom of your emails that says, think before you print. Yeah, think of the number of trees that are being saved there. Um, are you vegetarian? Do you, do, you, do you kill animals? Yeah, you, you eat dead animals. All right. You see, do I? No, I don't eat dead animals. I'm vegetarian. I'm vegan. I don't even have eggs. No, and milk, no, soya, I have soya milk, but not, uh, not cow's milk. Why should the poor cow have to give its milk up to satisfy my selfish needs? No, I think, I think it's wrong to be killing animals. I think... Uh, you plants, anyway. uh, sorry? You plants. plants are also alive, but they are sustainable, and, they, and I do. And, but I talk to them, I do apologize to them before I eat them. I do talk to the, uh, the, the, the flowers and the plants. My shoes, I don't wear leather shoes. My shoes are plastic. My um, quasi-nephew was very environmentally aware. He was even more extreme than I am. Uh, and he wouldn't wear leather. He wouldn't have a leather belt. He wouldn't have leather shoes. And he did see an advert on a website for cardboard shoes. So very thick card, very thick, but like, like thicker than this... Uh, calculator box and they cost something in the region of a hundred and thirty pound pair and he bought two pairs, he bought two pairs of these shoes to save himself having to wear leather shoes because it was wrong to kill animals and he was in London one day wearing his cardboard shoes and it started to rain and the cardboard bleh, it disintegrates and he's walking through and flapping with his, with his destroyed shoes. So that went by the board. He also then started dating and, and now living with a Canadian girl and she said she respected his right to be vegetarian but don't expect me to cook two meals, I'll cook my own and you can cook your own. So he's now started eating steaks and sausages again, so he's, he's back on the... Uh, on the traditional diet, but no, I'm I'm um, vegan. I don't have eggs, um, and I do apologise to the cornflakes when I'm pouring my soya milk onto the cornflakes. I'm saying I'm apologising to the sweet corn and say I'm sorry, but I have to survive. So, uh, who are the people who are affected by an entity's actions? There are, of course, many, including these are stakeholders, aren't they? These are stakeholders, the employees, customers, suppliers, the local community, and the environment may be affected as a result of our own production processes. Have you, have you ever flown into Bucharest? Have you ever flown into Bucharest? Certainly when I last flew into Bucharest, which was maybe eight, nine, ten years ago, I suppose, as the plane was coming into Bucharest Airport, you could look out of the window and you couldn't see Bucharest. There was a yellow cloud above Bucharest and, and pollution being pumped into the air by their factories. If you've ever been to Mexico, Mexico is in the hollow of some high mountains. And if you go up into the high mountains, you can't see Mexico City. You can't see it. We know it's there. It's under this cloud of pollution. 
Uh, Beijing. What about Beijing and the Beijing Olympics, where they had to cease production uh, for three months before the Beijing Olympics, so that the air had got a chance to clear, so that these sprinters wouldn't be gasping in chestfuls of pollution. Uh, but we're back again now, we're polluting again. Why should the Chinese be using chlorofluorocarbons in the production of their refrigerators? Why should that be acceptable? How can you stop them? How can you stop them using these ozone burning gases in the production of their refrigerators when the West has been producing refrigerators for a hundred years and only just recently have they decided that no, this is not a good thing and the Chinese have only just started. They've got another 98 years in which to carry on producing these damaging refrigerators just to get level. America, bless them. They won't sign up to the Kyoto Agreement. The Kyoto Agreement on quotas for pollution. We agree that you should be able to pollute 50 billion tons and you can pollute 20 billion tons and the Americas are going buying up other people's quotas so that they can pollute even more. This is wrong. This is damaging the planet and it's your planet and it's your children and your grandchildren who are going to suffer. You should be taking active steps now. Stop eating meat. How did I get on that bandwagon?